Welcome. Today we're going to talk about sex. We've got an amazing guest, Dr. Tom Murray, who wrote Making Nice with Naughty. And I felt the need to kind of let people know today is not going to be suitable for children. So make sure that you are ready to listen on your own as we talk about sex. And now Dr. Tom Murray is going to join us via Zoom, and I'm really excited to share this with you today. Welcome to the Redhead Reveal Podcast. I am Jen Pinkerton, your Redhead host, a psychotherapist, writer, speaker, the private practice owner of Pinkerton Psychotherapy, and a connection expert. I help people reveal their connectedness within their relationships and sexuality, understanding root causes of beliefs and behaviors that hold them back from success, and assist them to returning to the person that they are born to be before they were limited by trauma, societal or social concerns, or attachment wounds. Redhead Reveal is here to share concerns and questions, provide interviews with thought leaders and friends, and to hold space to discuss life struggles and encourage vulnerability, authenticity, growth, and self-awareness. Welcome, Dr. Tom. So excited to have you today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a joy to be on your show. Wonderful. You know, I got to tell you, I read the book. This was really amazing, really eye-opening. I'm so glad you liked it. Congratulations. Um, Before we dive into that, though, I want to really start off with giving you a chance to tell me about you. Can you tell our audience as well all about your experience and what you do and and where your expertise lies? Well, thank you. Yes, uh, I've been a sex therapist now since uh, 2015. Um, Before that, I was a university counseling center director and, and, and did that for a major performing arts conservatory here in the South. And then in 2017, you know, dived into private practice where now I have um, uh, two additional clinicians and we're based in central North Carolina and and, um, primarily just do sex and couples therapy. I understand that that is my specialization as well. So I, I love that just like you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, and also, as we were discussing before we got started, you were a for, either on the faculty of where I am going to school right now as a PhD yeah. student. So I thought that was kind of fun that we have that commonality. Yes, yes, the modern sex therapy. So, you know, I've I had a I've had great experience teaching for a variety of programs and I think um the uh, uh the freedom and flexibility that the Modern Sex Therapy Institute is offering to, for especially people who are interested in pursuing clinical sexology, you know, there's very few of those options and so I'm um honored to have been affiliated with Modern Sex Therapy Institute. Absolutely. Well, I want to dive in a little bit. I mean, as as I looked at, at your bio, though, I mean, you you gave yourself, you're very modest in what you were saying. But as I was looking, I mean, I think that you're so acclaimed from a presenter from, from these topics and you speak so often about it. It's no doubt that you would have put this all in a collective in a book. So, you know, <laughs> reading that, it was there was a lot of things that stuck out to me, especially as this is my area, not just from an interviewing standpoint, but from my area of specialization in my own practice as well some things that I thought were just really profound. And mm. if, if you don't mind, I'd love to kind of dive in with that. Um, Let's do it. The best the best quote that stuck out to me, and you're going to be quoted back to yourself, Dr. Tom. <laughs> um, you said that people get caught up in the thought that they must be free of discomfort, whatever that is, before they feel confident to take action. Yeah. And yeah. so I, it... I would love for you to expound on that a little bit and how that fits in and to this story. Well, you know, a lot of my patients and couples that I see, they've created this story that in order to take risk mm-hmm. in the bedroom uh, or in their relationship, they have to feel comfortable first. Mm-hmm. And and then what that means is they're constantly checking in. Do I feel comfortable yet? Do I feel comfortable yet? Is Am I free of anxiety? And whenever there's anxiety present, they assume that that means don't progress, don't take a chance, don't take that risk. And, and of course, you know, everything that we ever really wanted in life is found on the other side of comfort. I mean, you know that as a doctoral student, if you wanted to be comfortable, you would never go to <laughs> graduate Absolutely. school. You are correct in that. <laughs> and, and that is true, you know, being able to lean into what's difficult and, and being able to tell, you know, clients to say, you know, we can do hard things. Yes. And I think when it comes to sex and it comes to intimacy, there seems to be a stopgap 
a, a truly moment where the fear and that anxiety is so profound that uh, basically all thought is, is you know, escapes. There, there's really nothing else other than that moment. I think it's the the anxiety is is huge. And I see so many people with those same presenting concerns. And in Making Nice with Naughty, there was so much about that in here that you talked about with case studies and illustrations of couples that might present with maybe what seems as though a mismatched sexual desire. But in fact, it seemed as though it was more about you know, the, the terminology that you use about OC, this over-controlled temperament. And yes. so can you define for, for me and our audience really what is this over-controlled temperament and how it relates to sex? So broadly speaking, the over-controlled temperament is um, is uh, uh, what happens or it's a, dis- a descriptor for people who have too much self-control. You know, there's this... Um, this uh, continuum of over control and under control and and temperaments are just stable ways of showing up in the world such as introversion extroversion being two of the most famous temperaments and and those who are over controlled are uh, get a lot of uh, positive feedback by the world out there because the world loves over-controlled people. Uh, uh, we are the ones that get stuff done. And when I say we, I consider myself over-controlled. Anybody who goes to graduate school has to be over-controlled just to <laughs> get through the, the right. process. But generally speaking, the over-controlled temperament has these four primary uh, uh, characteristics that uh, overcontrol people tend to avoid uh, the unexpected. Uh, they resist n- newness and novelty. Um, they tend to be uh, rather rule oriented. Uh, uh, pr- they pursue perfectionism. Um, they they have their uh, ways about them that they like to do the same thing over and over again because they like consistency and certainty. Uh, they may experience a struggle with openness of emotion um, and, and may lack kind of uh, awareness about how they are signaling to other people within uh, their relationships uh, 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 you know, like having a stony face, for example, not being expressive in the face, they may not be aware that that's impeding their relationships. And, and, and lastly, they may have underdeveloped interpersonal dynamics, um, uh, uh, where they, they struggle being in relationships with other, they, for example, one of the most common complaints that people who are over controlled have is the sense of loneliness. Mm hmm. Right. So it, it what I what I found working um with my couples and, and individuals with their sexual problems, that there was this common theme of of sexual perfectionism mm-hmm. uh that was getting in their way. And I the I uh, talk about the four types of sexual perfectionism, the I have to be sexually perfect. My partner has to be sexually perfect. I think my partner thinks I have to be sexually perfect. And the last one is society expects me to be sexually perfect. And so when those are present, they uh, can certainly have a deleterious effect on people's sexual and intimate relationships. And what a burden that is to really bring into the bedroom. Oh, my gosh. For mm-hmm. sure. For sure. And and um, uh, how that burden then is communicated to their partner. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, uh, this feeling of I have to have things a certain way in order to be able to be with someone that I purport to love creates just another barrier to intimacy. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned perfectionism, and I've often viewed perfectionism as a quest for emotional safety, almost a need to to control the environment to feel safe. And I wonder do you see a lot of attachment wounds that are showing up in this way? Do you see a lot of that can contributing factors of feeling maybe a lack of emotional attunement that creates that? Is there that connection for you with this type? Yeah, you know, certainly can. Um, I wouldn't say there's, there's a specific uh, 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 attachment style Mm-hmm. that correlates with over-control. Uh, in part, there are two subtypes of over-controlled people that I 
I really regret that I didn't dive into uh, into the book. Well, uh, you can now. <laughs> yes. Tell me the, about the, it. The one subtype is the the overly disagreeable subtype, mm -hmm. um, and then the overly agreeable. So the overly disagreeables are the people that need to be right. Mm. And so they are more likely to have the avoidant attachment style, mm -hmm. right? And then the overly agreeable is the need to be liked. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so they are more likely to have the anxious uh, attachment style. By the way, this is my conjecture. There's not been literature to correlate these things. It's my just my clinical observation. Uh, and so how that shows up in relationship relative to attachment style, I think is is pertinent. So so uh, uh, what's underneath that though, to to underscore your point, is that the thing that over controlled people fear the most is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm overly disagreeable, I create certainty by push, maybe pushing people away. Self-fulfilling right? prophecy. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. then over the overly agreeable may create certainty by saying, I want to know where you are at every given moment. So I don't have to worry about uh, the mystery side. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So there's just different ways of handling it. So. You know, the mismatched sexual desire point that I made a moment ago, I feel like that's what a lot of couples present when they come to seek therapy because they don't really understand that all they know yes. is that I want something and this person wants something different and, and there's a big gap, there's a disconnect. That's and right. there is really a lack of that psychoeducation to understand what that is. So when people come to see you and the basis for you writing this book, where where all do you see that going? You know, is it often that we just were mismatched, they think, and then they learn that this is the, the the point of it. Or do you see other presenting concerns that still ends up getting to be, you know, what the answer is really this? I'm wondering what other paths do people take to this, to this, um, you know, knowledge that now they recognize, okay, this is really the stumbling block. This is the boulder that's in the bedroom with us, basically. You, well, you, you know, the, the, the psychoeducation is, I find, is the is the bulk of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly being in the South, a lot of people who've grown up in in families or communities where sex education was pretty um, Spartan, uh, that that talking about how there are the different types of desire. You know, our colleague Emily Nagoski, you know, dives into that um, as in in Come as You Are, and and underscoring that for for people to help them to see that spontaneous desire isn't the only one, nor is it the right one to have, but mm -hmm. that any, uh, uh, whatever whatever one's sexual desire type is, is the right and perfect type for them. And so that can be really helpful to uh, 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 break down for couples so that they're not unnecessarily pathologizing the other per person's desire and then, and then fueling or, or, uh, uh, criticizing one another, and that then leading to the toxicity uh, within their relationship. So uh, psychoeducation is a real important aspect of, of the work that we do. Um, and then certainly there are uh, multi, it's multifactorial in terms of what it contributes to people's challenges relative to, to uh, their their reconnection. You know, mm -hmm. one of the big ones that that uh, couples will say is, "I just feel like I don't know this person anymore," right? And I remind them that there was a time that they didn't know them. Yes, and they still fell in love. Right. So the, the back in the dating time, what was what, what changed? Right. That, that's right. So just the evidence of of the sense of mystery, they think that that's the problem when in fact that's the solution. Right. Right. And 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 uh, uh, privileging the not knowing the the rediscovery, um, not buying into the 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 illusion that you can know your partner. Mm -hmm. you know, talk about that in the book in terms of the difference, the differences between intimacy and closeness, you know, mm -hmm. that illusion that I can know my partner. You can't know your partner. There's just no way. The most you will ever know is the story your mind tells you about your partner. Yes, exactly. And in that, when you're talking about that, 
I remember you gave these building blocks in the book, and one of them was about establishing connection and that having that connection is going to get you to that level of intimacy you seek. Uh, right. I, we talk a lot about connection on this podcast because I really feel like it's the crux of so very many things. And it's what a lot of people are missing and they don't recognize what that is. But in sexuality terms, to have that that sex life where you feel like we have, we're thriving, you know, you've got to have that level of connection. And I think having an understanding of where that plays into that and how to achieve it, you know, with that authenticity, with the vulnerability, to, to, to get to that, basically the building block uh, of achieving some great levels of intimacy and in sex. It's, 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 I think, something that is a missing link often. Mm-hmm. You know, as you referenced um, in Come As You Are, um, the differences between that spontaneous or the responsive, I, I've often found that clients will come and they don't understand the difference between the two of them. And when they do start to learn about responsive desire, it's almost as though, oh, now we have something that's not about us. It's not that mm-hmm. I'm wrong. It's not that I've, I'm I'm yes. inferior in the bedroom. It's not that I don't know what I'm doing. It's just simply we're wired differently and that's Okay. Yes. Oh, for it sure. Can be different and have an amazing sex life once we understand each other. It, I, I feel like it's also no different than a fundamental idea that we kind of have to give love in a way that our partner will receive it, and mm. understand what how they receive it and what those messages are about sex and what the the story in their head is as well. I think that makes a really big difference. And you dive into that contextual desire a little bit in the book too, talking about that. Can you tell me a little bit more about the contextual piece of that? Yeah, it's this uh, awareness that we have brakes and accelerators. And so some of us have, um, uh, it's also called the dual response model. You know, some of us have certain uh, uh, uh elements in our lives that fuel our sexual desire and then uh, and then there may things be things that impede our sexual desire so for example uh a stress for mm-hmm. some people, if there's if they have a little bit of stress in their life, they are totally not interested in yes. in sex. While right. others say, you know, sex is a wonderful stress reliever, bring it on, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, body odor, for example, some people are get turned on when their partner comes back from the gym. Other people are like, Ugh, you know, I want to be clean. That's I want you to be clean. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, understanding what your partner's brakes and accelerators are, so that you know. Uh, to not contribute to the breaks and and you know what you can do to accentuate the ex- accelerators, but also that personal knowledge of what are my breaks, what are my accelerators, and am I doing what is necessary in order to um, minimize those breaks and accentuate those accelerators? I, I, you said it perfectly. You know, you had a case study about a couple that I, I'm, I can't remember their names in the book, but it was a couple where she wanted to have sex on Saturdays. She mm-hmm. knew that Saturdays were going to be the night they had sex. She could plan her life around that. That gave her that feeling of control and safety. And th- this is when it was going to happen. That's but right. the problem was in the book, you, you illustrated how, what if by then she, she doesn't have any desire. She's too tired to enjoy it. And so all these opportunities to have sex throughout the week were missed and and then she ends up not feeling satisfied sexually. And obviously her partner recognizes the, the disconnect there. Can you expand a little bit about that type of presenting client and what yes. that means in re- relation to the book? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, like you mentioned, over-controlled people love certainty. They love predictability. They love uh, uh, to schedule things often and know that, okay, this is, this is on the schedule. And, and, uh, they then are less likely to entertain um, their own uh, bodily sensations. So they may even during the middle of the week be desirous, but they're like, oh, I'm not going to give in to that. Uh, I know that we're going to do it on Saturday because there there are these other things that need my attention. And so I'm going to to do that. And and to me, that kind of... of, of um, a hoarding of time, which is often one of the things that over-controlled people do. They tend to be hoarders of 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 one thing or then uh, another, and and for over-controlled people, time can often be something that they try to hoard. Uh, mm-hmm. Got to save time, can't waste time, that kind of thing. And so they they put it on the the calendar 
uh, because the sense of duty, I have to do this, uh, you know, it's important, uh, but then often negate their own uh, drive uh, uh, and postpone it. And and even when, if they were to, to allow themselves to let loose, they would actually have a much better sexual experience. I understand. I agree with that completely. I think I've seen a lot of couples who, who come to seek sex therapy, a couple's counseling, either with the idea of, you know, it seems so structured, it's no longer any fun. Oh, that's right, right. It's like um, uh, uh, how I talk about the int- intimacy versus closeness. I, I describe that in the book where a lot of couples will come in and they'll say, we're not close anymore. Mm. And then when I spend a, 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 a 20 minutes with them, I'm realizing, oh, they're actually too close. Mm-hmm. They have too much closeness. Where I define closeness as, as low risk, low anxiety, high predictability, comfort, and familiarity. They've really privileged those things versus mm-hmm. intimacy is low risk, I mean, uh, high risk, high anxiety, low predictability, newness, novelty. Mm-hmm. No, right? Yes. And, and that's anxiety. Uh, inducing that that's there's an element of mystery and people shy away from that and then at the extreme you just have that old couple sitting at the diner for lunch and not a words exchanged between them right. all that they have is an unspoken contract to die together mm-hmm. right it's, it's like the, the view that you can get when you're watching a couple in a restaurant and the ones that sure. are talking and they're connected and they're animated mm. they'll add it oh they're dating they're dating <laughs> But we want to get away from that. We want to be in relationships that thrive. We want to be in relationships where we have this ultimate connection, both in the bedroom and outside the bedroom. And and with that type of client that comes to you and they're and they're stating that 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 they're too close. You know, they say that it's just kind of dead. They're great roommates. they're, They're great business partners, the business of being married, but they don't have that passion. How do you prescribe for them that solution when it is the exact situation that you just gave me? What would you prescribe with that? How do you get them to a level of understanding of what they need to do to shake things up? Well, I'm first uh, very curious, what are the rules that they tell themselves have to be in place Mm -hmm. in order for them to let loose? And then we actually question what those, you know, the validity of those rules, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And, and, and are they willing to be a little uncomfortable, a little awkward? If they have zero willingness to be awkward, it really doesn't bode well for the longevity of the relationship. Uh, because it's 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 when uh, Pema Chodron, a Buddhist nun, says, when you lean into anxiety, you're you're just that closer to the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. And so reframing for couples what it means to be. Uh, willing to be a little anxious, a little awkward as that pursuit of something new. So for example, I'll often ask couples, what percentage of the time when you have sex, is it in the bedroom? And a lot of the couples say, oh, it's all the time. Well, stop having sex only in the bedroom. You know, your mortgage is for the entire house. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you can enjoy the entire house, right? Yeah. Um, or I give an example in the book about uh, someone uh, uh, coming up behind their partner uh, in front of the window. And and the, uh, the partner gets really anxious. So what if people could see see us. And of course, that wasn't possible. It was dark inside and light outside. So the the, the likelihood of someone seeing was just, yeah. but that was too activating, too anxiety provoking. Yeah. Right? It overrode but, any, any possible ability to have pleasure from that because right. it overrode everything. Yeah. So mm-hmm. some people do need the, the, uh, they need in place certain elements that help them to feel safe and secure. So I give the metaphor of the fire of desire and, and these stones around, around the fire are really the things that we need in order to feel safe and secure. But one also has to, to come to the, to, uh, to the uh, relationship having seen themselves as sexual beings. Mm-hmm. 
you know, being becoming uh, uh, parents, for example, for a lot of people, just uh, uh, they their their sexual identity begins to erode over time because they've they've adopted a different identity, mom or dad, and that just uh, 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 isn't se- sexy. You know, I think uh, Esther I mean, Perel that's says problem, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think Esther Esther Perel says, uh, you know, no one wants to have sex with someone's mom. That's right. <laughs> <Someone's> exactly <that. laughs> right. And, right. And you touched on these these concepts of basically what I drill down to thinking. It's about being willing to be seen. Yeah. And that correlates with so much when it comes to, I think, healing from anything you know, being willing to be seen. And so a lot of couples that that come to seek help because they just don't have a a great sex life. So much of that relates to, are you comfortable being seen? Can you take the risk? Can you be willing for the fear of maybe I'm not going to be viewed the way I want to be viewed? Maybe it's not going to go well, but do you take the risk? Can you have that connection with your partner to do that, knowing that on the other side, you know, that discomfort's temporary because on the other side, imagine how great it would be to have this amazing sex life with your partner. And I think that I, it, it's so profound of a thought, but yet a lot of people miss that. Right. I, I'm thinking of a couple that I saw a few weeks ago where a, a new couple, the um, uh, the the husband has, has had a history of erectile uh, uh, dysfunction and rapid ejaculation. And they've been together for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, the wife said, you know, all of a sudden he he uh, uh, whips out this strap on dildo and he puts it on and, and it was some of the best sex. And he leans into me and he goes, I read that in your book. <laughs> <laughs> and that takes a lot of risk. Right. Particularly yes. for men to the very notion of wearing a strap on dildo when um uh, uh, as a as a as a substitute, if you will, for an erect penis, so that you can still have fun. For mm-hmm. some people, they immediately go to, "Oh, that's emasculating. I could never do that." But when you think about sex as really the pursuit of pleasure, mm-hmm. then it then you're you're uh, seeing that oh, there's so many ways in which we can have a good time. But when you have a performance based view of sex, then it's like, oh, sex is only good if if it looks like this, mm-hmm. right? And now, now we're rule oriented and rigid versus mm-hmm. pleasure based, which is, you know, hey, if if I'm wearing a strap on dildo and I'm um, um, pleasing my partner, I can derive pleasure out of seeing that pleasure. Yes. And on that note, uh, it, it makes me think of that inheritance that is passed down to us sometimes of mm. what's appropriate. What yeah. what have we inherited? What were the, the generational trauma or the ideas, just even belief systems, not necessarily mm. traumatic, but just inherent ideas that were modeled or, or um, we inferred that this is the way we're supposed to be. And can we do something different? Can we recognize that that we can throw all those rules out of the window? Can we take risk? And you mentioned, you know, even something as as what to some would think so elementary toys in the bedroom, toys using insects. But some people feel like that means we're less than. It, right. it, it really attacks that feeling of I don't belong here. I'm not worthy. I, I'm not doing a good job. I'm not enough. And I think I, tapping into I'm not enough, th- then we've opened up, you know, a big can of worms here yeah. with how uh, people feel. To, to add to that, um, uh, a lube, mm-hmm. right? Some people think, oh, if I have to use lube, you know, or if my partner has to use lube, that there's something that that's evidence of something wrong. When, in fact, I think that's evidence of something right in that you have the kind of relationship where you want to maximize pleasure. And if that means reaching over to the bedside table and getting a pump of lube, because that would help to make enjoying sex uh, easier, it's a sign of something right. Absolutely. You know, it should be this idea that anything goes. This is about us. This is about these two people in that moment, or even if it's not that type of relationship, three people, whatever works. But in that context, it's about whatever's going to make everybody feel good. It's consensual, and then it can yes. be amazing. And when it comes to to you know what you're saying too, sometimes lube is one of the things that's needed just from a, a steer standpoint. If you're looking at a biology standpoint, you know there, there's some women that that come and they see sex is painful. 
And so they just stop having sex when, you know what, if you can be seen and you can communicate and you can be vulnerable with your partner and say, Hey, it just doesn't feel good. I didn't want to tell you. So I've just avoided sex. But you know, if we would maybe use lube, it could feel a heck of a lot better. That changes things fundamentally. And I, I think it's often something I see this unfortunate lack of communication and it's not just talking, it's being taking the risk in what you're mm, saying. Mm, mm, yeah. That, that uh, 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 vulnerability, which mm-hmm. from an over-controlled, again, you know, over-controlled people, vulnerability is really tough. Scary. Scary. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's the, it's the antithesis of the certainty, mm-hmm. right? And so they rely on. What was that? That they've come to rely on, right? That's right, That's, right. And it's in every part of their life. It, for the over-controlled person, the, sex is one part of where that control is showing up. It's showing up in all these things. Oh, and yes. so it's it's so certain in every part of their life. How could we, how could we leave that behind here? Because we mm-hmm. need it and use it in so many other ways. And, and as your book points out, there's nothing negative about being that over-controlled person. There's a lot of amazing strengths in being That's right. That. You know, right. it's one of the things that make us unique. Everybody's different. Every brings their own stuff to the table and it's learning. Okay. But maybe can we leave that behind and not put it on the table just while we're having sex? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that, that, that is really what was important about the book was to highlight that OC comes with a lot of virtues mm-hmm. and uh, uh, if it is going to become a problem, where does it show up as a problem? I tend to find it showing up in people's sex and intimate relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, I give the example of, um, uh, an, you know, the stereotypical over-controlled person goes behind their partner to rearrange the dishwasher because it wasn't, quote, done right. Right. And so you think, <laughs> oh, I'm just going to do it because I want to make sure the dishes are clean. Well, that that may be true, but the 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 partner perceives it as a form of criticism, mm-hmm. right? Back to the, I, I'm not enough. I'm not I'm, doing it right. I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so that's the dynamic that you often see where you have a partner who is more over-controlled than the other. Mm-hmm. I, I very rarely see over-controlled people with under-controlled people. It's usually one person's over-controlled and the other is less over-controlled, mm-hmm. but the more over-controlled person assumes that the other must be under-controlled when in fact, they're just less over-controlled. Right. Uh, but then, you know, you, you get that, that um, uh, uh, somewhat of a, almost a pissing contest where they can be somewhat competitive too with each other. And, and you know, that, to, to be in a relationship where you feel like you're on opposing teams isn't very erotic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's kind of a libido killer if you think about it. <laughs> yes, yes, right. for sure. Um, you know, in the book also, Making Nice with Naughty, you mentioned that you have a self-test in there. You talked about your introduction and I saw it in chapter one. I love that, that when someone reads this book, if this is resonating, if it's sounding familiar, if they're recognizing some of the traits, they have the ability to kind of kind of check that out without really maybe being ready to go seek help on it, they can kind of look at that differently. And your book pres- you know, prescribes this way, I think, to view it so differently in such an, a, a way that, again, doesn't pathologize and it just educates and, and opens a door for a very different experience sexually. Yeah, well, you know, I wish um, uh, I was more familiar with this concept years ago. I, I was in a long-term relationship and uh, went to see a psychologist and uh, uh, it was like the second session, first session. And I said to the psychologist, you know, I've come to realize I don't exude much of a sexuality. And she says, Tom, you're right. You don't. And I think but- that that I think that <laughs> I was so intensely o- uh, over controlled up, up until that point. I'm still over controlled. There's not enough drugs or therapy in the world that will make that different. But, you know being able to turn down the the volume on my over-controlledness so that I can experience the the joy and aliveness of life that so many of our under-controlled people just take naturally. Right. Right. It, it, it's kind of just something they take for granted because they don't recognize that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Where they would be absolutely uh, feel feel tr- uh, caged by the rules and 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 structure that so many over controlled people require. Mm-hmm. 
Do you see, you mentioned that you don't often see the opposites, but I, I can't help but think there must be a little bit of yin and yang in that to some degree, you know, that sometimes we are attracted to someone who's a little more free spirited than we are. And, and that oh, they're, yeah. you know, that free spirited person that I can use that label is also maybe more attracted to someone that's a little more structured because we're, we're each giving each other something we don't have. Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, uh, certainly true, even within my own relationship. Um that uh, uh, there's a a a style uh, uh, with my partner where there's much more um, emotional expressiveness, a much more uh, variation of of emotion, and, and like a very typical OC person, you know, I can uh, uh, I'm the kind of person that if you saw me out in the world and you asked me how I was doing, one of my favorite F words is fine, which is very <laughs> common among other over controlled people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, we, we tend to have have a, a limited range of uh, emotions. But then there are times when we have emotional leakage, right, where we might get, you know, incredibly excited or maybe even uh, angry and we leak it out a, a, a little bit for, but usually that happens only within a very uh, close knit group of people. I understand. You know, this is so, um, I think your book really hits on something that's so profound. And and I really hope that, that a lot of people will take the time to kind of think about this, to kind of look at themselves in the mirror and really recognize, you know, what do we want out of our sex life? What are we missing? And could this be something that really pertains to me? And yeah. you positioned the book and wrote it in the way that I felt like as I was reading it. Are you talking to me? And that's, <laughs> that's when you know you hit something, you know, you know, you've gotten there. Um, well, to recap, you know, Dr. Tom Murray, the author of Making Nice with Naughty. It's just so great to have you here today. I want to kind of mention where everybody can find you. You know, obviously your book is available on, you know, all of the major booksellers online. Right. As well. um, and your Instagram and your socials, I always like to give a shout out to that. Yours is Dr. Tom Murray uh, for Instagram. Um, um, doctor, That's all together. And then Dr. Tom Murray, Dr. Period, Tom Period Murray on Facebook um, and YouTube, Real Dr. Tom Murray. That's awesome. So I, I want to make sure that people can find you, can learn more about you and and can really, man, read this book, get this book. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show and and, and uh, availing me to your listeners. It was a great opportunity. It's really been educational for me and a lot of fun. And I can't wait to see what you do next. So we'll have to stay in touch. Indeed. All right. Thank you, Dr. Tom Murray. And we'll bye-bye. be talking soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.